in Massachusetts with the man everyone knows, Andrew Carnegie. Thank you so much for allowing us to come visit you on this beautiful estate. Now, Mr. Carnegie, everyone has heard your name. You are one of the most well-known businessmen of all time. Tell me where this all started. I was born in 1835 in Dunfermline, Scotland, to parents who highly valued literature and education. I was never very formally educated, but I have been an avid reader since I can remember. At the age of 13, my family and I moved from Scotland to Allegheny, Pennsylvania, where I started out working as a bobbin boy. <laughs> Institute 
institution, which provides research for American colleges and universities. Huh. And the Carnegie Corporation, which is meant to aid education, higher education institutes. Five million dollars of mine have been donated to the New York Public Library as well. In all, I have donated 90% of my fortune. Today, I'm happy to spend the rest of my life on my estate here in Lenox, Massachusetts. Oh, and a beautiful state it is, Mr. Carnegie. I and the rest of the world have learned a lot about you from this. Thank you so much for allowing us to come, and I wish you a peaceful retirement. Until next time, America. I'm Tommy McMillian. Good night. Good evening, America. Charlie Trout here with Mr. John Rockefeller. So tell me, where did your success begin? I was born in Richford, New York in 39. My father was a pitchman and traveled for months at a time. I was mainly raised by my mother, who was very religious and a disciplined woman. She taught me to work, save, and give to charities. At the age of 16, my family and I moved to Cleveland, Ohio, where I attended high school from 53 to 55. There, I practiced my public speaking skills on the debate team. After high school, I attended Folsom's Commercial College for 10 weeks, where I learned bookkeeping, penmanship, commercial history, banking, and exchange. I got a job in, as an assistant bookkeeper with Hewitt and Tunnel, who were commission merchants and produce shippers. Stop. <laughs> By 58, I was arranging transportation deals and engaging in trading ventures. When did you become an independent businessman? When I was 19, I went into business for myself and formed a partnership with my neighbor, Maurice Clark. Wow. We each spent $2,000 to work on commission merchants and hay, meat, grain, and other goods. <laughs> Within the first year of business, we had grossed $450,000. <laughs> During the Civil War, our business expanded, but by the early 60s, I realized that the future of the business would be limited and invested in oil. I bought my own plumbing supplies and built my own barrels for the oil. Wow. In February of 65, I bought out the Clark Brothers and built another refinery in Cleveland the following year. Wow. In 67, Henry M. Flagler became my business partner and we created the largest refiner in the world. Impressive. I believe in our business was that nothing should ever be left uncounted or measured. Mm. Having the highest quality of oil was always our goal. Three years later, Standard Oil Company of Ohio was created and I owned 30% of the company. At this wow. time, I found the state of oil business rather chaotic and believed that having one large company would be the solution to the chaos. Oh. By April of 73, almost all the refineries in Cleveland had been purchased by us. Wow. We expanded into New York and Pennsylvania as well. In 75, all of the standard pipelines were merged into United Pipeline. Wow! Tell me about the Standard Oil Trust. Oh, uh, yes. In 82, a board of trustees, with me as the leader, was set up and all of the standard properties were placed in its hands. We elected all of the directors and officers of the company. From what I've heard, the Standard Oil Trust was not popular among Americans. Why? Why is that? What did you do to fix that? The Standard Oil Trust allowed Standard to reach nearly early every American town. Although it was successful for a short time, it had been taken away and traded for actual shared stock. What did you do after retiring from Standard Oil? With my fortune of Nine hundred million dollars. Wow! I had to donate a portion of it. Well, I donated seventy-five million dollars to the University of Chicago and established the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research for fifty million dollars. Wow! The General Education Board was a foundation I created for fifty million dollars to help establish high schools through the South. Wow. When the Rockefeller Foundation was officially established, I donated $235 million. I hope that although I have made millions
millions in my company that the public knows that I do not keep it all to myself. Mr. Rockefeller, you are a very generous man. America has made many improvements thanks to your business and educational foundations. Thank you for sharing your story of success with us tonight. Well, that's all for tonight, America. This is Charles Trout signing off. Stay classy, America. Hello, America. Today we have a very special guest coming to our show. You may love him, loathe him, respect him, or reject him, but regardless, there is no question that John Pierpont Morgan is one powerful man, and without him our country would not be the same. So without further ado, welcome to the Chad Show, JP. I'm your host, Chaz Cassidy. Hello, Chaz. It's good to meet you. It is an absolute honor to meet you, Johnny. Please, Chaz. It's Mr. Morgan. Oh, I do apologize, Mr. Morgan, sir. It is not often that I get to interview intimidatingly formidable people such as yourself. Allow me to continue. Just as Andrew Carnegie is with steel and John Rockefeller is with oil, you, sir, are synonymous with finance. Quite literally, in fact, because of your bank, J.P. Morgan Company. Could you tell us a little bit more about how you got that started? Well, my father was a partner in a London-based merchant baking firm, so I was growing up in Connecticut. I was surrounded by both wealth and principles of finance. After finishing my studies in Europe, I worked with my father for a year before moving to New York City in 1857 to make a name for myself in the finance industry. Mm -hmm. I worked for some time at New York Investment House of Duncan Sherman, however. In 1861, I decided to found my own bank, J.P. Morgan & Company, in 1871. Anthony Drexel and I formed a partnership. Drexel, Morgan and Company. Mm. Has a ring to it, doesn't it? Oh, indeed. Which soon became America's foremost banking firm. Oh. It was after Anthony's test that I returned to the name J.P. Morgan and Company. Oh. Ah, I see. That is simply fantastic, Mr. Morgan, sir. It was your role as a part of Drexel, Morgan and Co. which led to your involvement in the railroad industry. Am I correct? Yes, Chaz, you are. In 1879, we successfully sold stock in William Vanderbilt's New York Central Railroad Company without driving down the share price. Oh, impressive. Which gained prestige for our partnership and resulted in me becoming a director of the New York Central. Oh. I have had my hand in the railroad industry from that point forward. In 1885, I threatened to block a railroader's investment capital in order to force them to end their silly rate wars. Their competition was going to ruin the profitability of my investments, and I could not allow that to happen. In addition, I also arranged the finances for the Great Northern and Northern Pacific Lines, as well as the Southern Railroad. I eventually gained a vital role in roughly one-sixth of the railway in our country, which was greatly due to Northern Securities Company. Golly, Mr. Morgan, you sound like a bit of a control freak. <laughs> I just didn't the Northern Securities Company get broken up by the federal government when Teddy took office? Yes, unfortunately we were forced to disband because of the Supreme Court found it to be in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Everyone was so afraid of monopolies. I fail to see what is so wrong with the company created to control several different railroads. It certainly kept the American Railroad's uniform. <laughs> I don't know about you, Mr. Morgan, but it seems to me a little bit harsh for the government to do that to you after all you have done for them. Would you like to share with the audience what you have done to help out our national government? I bailed out the U.S. Treasury twice. Thanks to me, our government did not run out of gold in default. <laughs> in 1885, I loaned gold to the U.S. government. I helped again in the panic of 1907, when I convinced bankers and businessmen of New York to promise their own assets to provide stability for our nation's financial system. Oh, thank you, Mr. Morgan. I, for one, truly appreciate that. <laughs> Just as I appreciate some of your more philanthropic ventures, I, I am aware that you are a large contributor to both the Episcopal Church and to the American Museum of Natural History serving as a trustee for 44 years and being one of the museum's leading donors. 
Jazz, I don't know how you got that information. I generally donate on the condition of anonymity. <laughs> oh, please, Mr. Morgan, don't be so humble. <laughs> anyway, I hear that you are also a lover of fine art. Can't share. Oh, of course not, Jazz. Art is one of my true passions in life. Oh. I have played an influential role in the Metropolitan Museum of Art since 1888, oh. when I began my... I have been president of the Met since 1904. I have spent about two-thirds of my estate on the acquisition of art, and I've donated much of it to the Met. I have my art collection willed to my son once I die, and he is free to do with it as he chooses. But there is a very good chance he will donate much of it to the Met. Oh, and the world of art greatly appreciates you for it. Unfortunately, America, it is time to wrap up our time here with Mr. J.P. Morgan. Although we did not get to it in our interview, it is worth mentioning that Morgan also led to the creation of General Electric and to the consolidation of history's first billion dollar corporation, U.S. Steel. With a net worth that is only one-tenth that of Rockefeller, Morgan has managed to become the man with the greatest influence over our nation's economy. Thank you, Mr. Morgan, on behalf of the whole country for both your time here tonight and your ambitious spirit. Thank you, Chaz. Until next time, America, I'm Chaz Cassidy. It was great having